So Kayleen is a last year, I think that's the term we use now, last year PhD student at UC Berkeley, working with Claire Tomlin and Jack Gallant for the intersection of robot learning and, and neuroscience. Um, so we met at the, the Simons workshop that Anand was at the summer that Shiri ran, um, and we've been fortunate and we've been collaborating since. So, but very happy to have Kenny at TTIC. So, um, yeah. First of all, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for uh, being here. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to uh, try to share some of these uh, results with you all. And I'm also just really grateful to have the opportunity to, to be here at TTIC and to meet with all of you. Um, I've had uh, really fascinating conversations with many of you so far, but um, if we haven't talked yet and you'd like to chat, maybe if you'd like to chat after seeing a little bit more about what I've been working on, um, please reach out. I would, I would really love to, to talk to all of you who are interested. Um, cool. So the uh, title of this work is Comparing Deep Learning-Based Autonomous Driving Algorithms uh, with the Brain Activity of Human Drivers. Um, so this is going to be a little bit uh, more focused, I would say, on the methods and how I'm thinking about modeling this problem than on specific results. Um, and if you have questions about any part of this, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'm really happy to uh, have a discussion about how we're thinking about this problem. So maybe for some motivation. Um, over the summer, I had the opportunity to visit some uh, factories that have been robotized in Denmark. So this, for example, is a picture I took at Linac, um, which is a company that makes uh, linear accelerators. And um, the, the real situation of the robots in these factories is that they are doing uh, highly repetitive tasks um, that are sort of part of this manufacturing process. And they are still in cages, right? They're separated from humans. And this has really been the, you know, despite all of the uh, really cool research that's been happening in robotics, this is still by far the most uh, frequent use case that we see, where robots are sort of doing these repetitive tasks and fully separated from humans. Um, but I also uh, live close to San Francisco, and something really interesting has happened there in the past few years, um, where we now see autonomous vehicles that are actually on the streets, um, operating fully autonomously. Um, and I see them every time I go into the city, I see like maybe dozens of these in a single trip. So they're really all over the place there. And this is a, a really interesting shift, uh, not just from the technological perspective, but also because of the fact that this is really the first time we've had uh, fully autonomous robots um, interacting in environments that were designed for humans, performing a task that uh, humans typically perform, and doing this all in an environment that's actually shared with humans. So it's really the first time, I think, where we have a, a real like, direct uh, comparison or equivalence between these uh, robotic systems and between something that humans are doing, and that is you know, very important for um, human day-to-day uh, -day life. And so I think what this really got me thinking about was that, well, what could we learn from trying to understand how these autonomous driving algorithms are similar to or different from uh, how humans are thinking about this uh, task of needing to navigate through an environment, um, negotiate things with other human drivers, um, and then operate all of this at you know, a very high uh, margin of safety as well. And so when you think about uh, comparing robots and humans, there's a few different uh, possible benefits that we might think about uh, getting from doing this. So one is that the differences might inspire you know, more performance or more interpretable robot algorithms. So if humans are doing some part of this task consistently better than robots, um, then maybe that's a sort of a signal that that's something we should focus on when trying to make improvements. And you know, one response to this might be that, well, you know, robots don't need to do the exact same thing as humans in order to be performant. They can have different strategies for doing it. But something that's pretty interesting about autonomous driving is that it's not a problem that can be solved by robots in isolation, right? They also need to do this interaction with humans. And part of that process is it's going to be very useful to be able to make good predictions about humans. And so having robots that really understand how humans are driving is going to be, I think, pretty useful, regardless of whether robots are like perfectly mimicking that process of how humans are driving. Um, another uh, reason might be to actually go in the other direction, right? So maybe by um, building uh, autonomous systems that are you know, inspired to greater or less degrees by humans, uh, it'll actually help us then understand and model humans. You know, to the extent that these systems are similar to humans, um, that maybe gives us some confidence that we actually understand how humans are doing this task. And that's really interesting to you know, people like neuroscientists and psychologists who are, are studying things at that level as well. And then finally, the, the most uh, speculative of these uh, is, I think, something that is also kind of interesting and maybe a little bit uh, you know, farther out in the future, but 
really like what is the possibility space of, of intelligent behavior? You know, given that you want to be able to uh, complete this very sophisticated and difficult task, um, what are the different uh, possible like systems that could actually accomplish this task? You know, do they all have to look like humans, or could we get very different systems that are still able to do this? I think is kind of an interesting question. Okay, so so that gives a little bit of motivation, um, but now I want to be a little bit more specific about what exactly I'm talking, uh, what I, exactly I want to compare here. So. The, uh, this project was really started because there is a lab at Berkeley, uh, the uh, Jack Gallant Lab, that uh, collects fMRI recordings of the uh, brain activity of human subjects. And they recently collected this uh, specific data set where they have uh, humans who are in this fMRI machine, but they're actually uh, driving in a pretty realistic and naturalistic simulator um, while the recordings are being taken. And so this was the work of uh, my collaborator, uh, Tian Jiao Zhang, uh, who collected this kind of data uh, from these subjects. And what this means is that we actually have access to the uh, a pretty um, detailed uh, amount of information about the brain activity of people while they're doing this uh, interactive task. And so I thought this presented a really cool opportunity to compare not just at the behavioral level, but actually at the cognitive or representational level um, between uh, these human drivers and uh, autonomous driving algorithms. And so the, uh, the idea for this project is going to be to take these, uh, this data that was collected from these human drivers and take these uh, same inputs, these same like images that are generated from the simulator while they were driving and actually uh, use that as the input to an autonomous driving algorithm, specifically a deep neural network that has been trained to do autonomous driving, and to actually compare the um, activations of that network. So it's, it's a very, um, I think, like analogous idea. So for in the human brain, um, when you're looking at this, uh, this image and you're deciding what driving decision to make, uh, the activity of each of your neurons is some function of that task and of what you're seeing at the moment. And similarly, the, the deep neural network, its activations, the activity of each of the nodes in that network is also going to be a function of this input. So we can really set up a, a direct comparison between these things to really understand like, how similar are these, these representations or these computations uh, that are being used to decide what the correct driving action to take is at, at any given time. Um, but to, to talk a little bit more about uh, how this comparison is actually going to work, I want to back up and give a little bit more context for how people have thought about making these kinds of comparisons um, with more general types of data. And so specifically, one of the, the most um, well-studied uh, areas in, in neuroscience is actually the visual system. So going back to the work of Hubel and Weasel in 1959, for which they won a Nobel Prize, um, they found that they were able to uh, record the activity of single neurons in, in the brain of a cat and found that these uh, neurons would be um, very active when they showed a particular kind of stimulus, which was a line segment of a particular orientation. And so what they found was that these cells were very selective um, for this uh, particular kind of stimulus in this particular location and, and orientation. And so we could think about uh, if we want to try and then uh, use this to um, understand uh, larger populations of neurons, we could think about um, taking some uh, hypothesized uh, transformation of an image. So we have like a, a particular input image here. And then we do just a, a regular convolution with some kind of filter that's expressing this idea of like lines of particular orientations, so like a Gabor filter, and then do some sort of nonlinear activation, which is just saying that when you are seeing enough of a um, match between the input image and this particular filter, um, you're going to say that the, that uh, neuron should be um, highly active. It should be really responding to this. And so at the end result of this process, we get a feature which is sort of summarizing um, how active a, a neuron that is really responding to this particular uh, input should be. And then if we want to really understand the, uh, a bunch of neurons that are maybe selective for like different orientations of lines and different uh, you know, frequencies or locations, um, we can come up with a bank of these kind of filters, uh, put them through the same uh, nonlinear activation, and then get a vector of features that are expressing the general hypothesis that neurons are going to be responding to these um, patterns of sort of edge detections. So this is like sort of a, a hypothesis about the uh, visual system as doing something like an edge detector. 
Um, in order to uh, actually use this uh, feature vector to get some set of predictions about uh, some specific uh, uh, neurons in the brain, we need to, uh, or so we want to take the, um, sorry, so the, for a particular neuron, we don't know which of these filters is going to be the most selective for it. And so in addition, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, learn some set of linear weights um, that is going to be telling us basically for each particular neuron, um, which of these filters is it selective for, or maybe it's selective for some combination of them. And so that's going to give us our final prediction for a specific neuron. And then finally, if we want to do predictions for a bunch of neurons, um, or maybe for a voxel, which in fMRI, a voxel is like a three-dimensional pixel, and it's the, um, the finest uh, unit of resolution that we have for that modality. And so that's going to be sort of, you can think of this as something like the sum of the activity of something about on the order of 10,000 uh, neurons that are all in the same uh, area of the brain. And so uh, when we think about uh, trying to do predictions for uh, multiple neurons or multiple voxels, um, we're just going to be taking the same uh, set of features, but we're going to be learning a different set of linear weights for each of these to get our, our final predictions for each of them. Okay, so, the, uh, so that was all just for a single image, but in order to actually come up with this model, um, we need to have some way to actually learn what these linear weights should be uh, for each of the things we're trying to predict. And so the way we do that is we come up with a whole data set that's going to be a bunch of different images. And we're going to split that into a, a train set and a test set. And so now our features and our brain activity are both going to be uh, two-dimensional matrices that have um, images on the, the y-axis, the way I've drawn it here. And uh, we're going to use these two uh, sets of data to uh, do a linear regression to get these uh, weights that we say are going to be um, allowing us to go from the features that we're hypothesizing are capturing the activity of, of this part of the brain um, and using that to come up with some predictions of the brain activity. And the way this works in practice is that we do um, cross-validation on, um, on the training data to select our um, regularization parameters for the linear regression. And then we try to predict on a test data set. And then the, we look at the um, predictions of the neural activity and the actual neural activity uh, on those test uh, images. And to the extent that those two things are correlated with each other, we can say that our model has actually captured something about the activity of the brain. Right? So the, to the extent that we're able to do these kind of successful predictions, um, it seems like our hypothesized set of features are actually expressing something about what the brain is, is actually doing in response to these inputs. Question. Yeah. Actually, two questions, but feel free to defer the second one. So the first one, really quick, the, the human brain features, let's call them the elements, are somehow dependent on the image, but we don't know exactly what the neural features, depending on architecture of neural network, may be localized to this particular area of the image, are you extracting specifically features which are global somehow? Um, so they are going to be specific to, to different parts of the image, and so, but that's also going to be true for the brain activity because, so like for example, the visual cortex is uh, retinotopic, and so based on, uh, if you're looking at like the center of the image, for example, there are going to be different parts of the brain that are going to be more responding to different parts of the image. This is V1 you are looking at or something like that? Uh, for example, yeah. Okay, I see. Okay. And the second question, so you essentially, and I think you said correlation, then you're looking at correlation. So this is a particular direction of prediction. You can also predict in the other direction or in fact do something else entirely like CCA. So why is this direction chosen? Yeah, so I think the, um, between the, so this is like the encoding direction of trying to predict the brain activity from the features. And then the other direction would be like a decoding direction. Um, I think the main reason is that if you're thinking about um, like how good of a job you're doing at modeling the brain activity, it sort of makes sense to have that comparison be in the space of the um, activations of the brain. But I think the more, um, I guess, like uh, meta or methodological reason is just that the uh, Gallant Lab has like a line of work that, that uses this kind of framework. And so this makes it easier to compare to their previous results and, and sort of adopt their kind of methods. Thank you. Um, cool. 
So, so this is uh, all uh, just for, um, for example, uh, doing this on a set of images. Um, and when people have used in the past uh, features like a set of Gabor filters, they found that they are in fact able to predict uh, brain activity when uh, subjects are looking at arbitrary images, um, especially in uh, areas of the brain that we associate with lower level vision. So things like kind of doing these basic uh, image processing steps. However, it doesn't work so well for areas that we associate with higher level vision. So for example, areas that we know become very active when you're looking at like faces um, or like objects versus uh, natural scenery or things like this. And so uh, something uh, really interesting happened starting about um, 10 years ago when people started uh, building these kinds of models with uh, features from deep neural networks for the first time. So this was a paper from uh, 2013 where they did this with a, a deep convolutional neural network and found that they were able to predict uh, some of these um, higher level visioned areas in the brain for the first time uh, at a high degree of accuracy um, using these kind of features that had been extracted from a, a network um, that, was, that was good at doing object recognition. And then there's been a, a continuing to ha have work in this area. For example, there was a paper last year where they were doing this um, both in the encoding and the decoding direction, actually, um, where they were using a, the um, latent representation from a diffusion model and similarly finding that they were able to uh, predict the uh, more higher level visual activity in, in human subjects. Okay. So, but we're, we're not just interested in uh, people looking at images, we're interested in this more uh, dynamic and interactive task of actually um, doing closed loop driving. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is actually the first work that has tried to, to do this kind of uh, comparison um, with a, one of these uh, closed loop tasks that isn't just uh, measuring the response of the brain when you're looking at some stimulus um, passively. And so our setup is going to be uh, very similar to what I was describing before. But now, instead of just showing a, a set of images, we're going to have the uh, brain activity that has been recorded over time. So these uh, TRs are the, um, in the fMRI machine, this is sort of like the finest temporal resolution that we have. So we're taking a new snapshot of brain activity every roughly two seconds. And then we're going to be uh, comparing that with the uh, activations of the deep neural network uh, when we give these same images uh, to it as input. So try to set up as direct a comparison as possible. Um, and so in order to, to do this, we need to choose a specific uh, model, a driving model that we're going to use. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, companies like Waymo and Tesla don't just uh, open source their driving models for us to, to try and do like the state of the art comparison. Um, but fortunately, there is a, a fairly thriving academic community that tries to develop these kind of models and puts them in competitions, like, for example, the Carlo leaderboard challenge. And so for this work, we just picked a model that performed uh, reasonably strongly on this Carlo leaderboard challenge. It's the, um, like the uh, fifth row here, the learning from all vehicles one. Um, after we started working on this project, it, it was surpassed by a few other approaches. But you can see that, for example, the root completion rate of 94% uh, here is, is still pretty uh, competitive compared to the other algorithms. So uh, this isn't like a, as good as a Waymo uh, driver, for example, but it's still um, hopefully good enough to give us a good sense of um, what the capabilities of these models are. And so this is the... So, sorry, it's kind yeah. of, um, probably not super important, but do we actually know how well Waymo would do on this task? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't. To, I don't think they've. We like, just presume that yeah. they must be good because. They're, I mean, okay. I think the uh, if you if you stare hard at these numbers, you can see that, for example, it's making like this infraction penalty, uh, or like infractions per kilometer. Um, this is corresponding to, uh, I guess, needing an intervention every. So like 0.04 would be, um, yeah, and, like that many and kilometers. And way more reportedly need less. Yes. They what? They reportedly need less. Else. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, yes. <laughs> but I guess you can look at collisions with pedestrians, that kind of, those kind of things have to be reported. And so hopefully it's not 0 0.04 or 0.04. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. So uh, this is the architecture of this uh, particular approach that we chose. And I'll go into uh, each of what these different modules is in a little bit more detail as I go through the results. Um, but just to give you a high-level overview here, the idea is that um, even though this is a, a deep end-to-end -end neural network, it's actually split into these different uh, components that have slightly different training losses during the first part of training. So the idea is that they train them on different objectives, and then they sort of, in the last stage of training, 
glue them all together, and then do the end-to-end -end, uh, learning objective for the final stage of training. Um, but the interesting thing here is that because there are these different modules that are trained to do slightly different things, um, we can actually not just say, you know, how well do all of these, uh, or how well do the features from across the network uh, compare to the brain, but we can actually look at these different components of the deep neural network and compare that to different parts of the brain that have uh, known functions um, from other studies in neuroscience. Uh, so this is just an example of what this uh, neural network looks like on the data from the simulator. So in the uh, top row of images here, I have the uh, RGB image inputs. And then the second row is a uh, semantic segmentation step where it's just uh, for each pixel in the input images, it's classifying it as a vehicle, a road, um, a lane marking, or a pedestrian, or something else. And then uh, that gets fused with the LiDAR input, which is shown on the right. So given the known geometry uh, between the LiDAR and the uh, cameras, you can say for each uh, point in the input images, um, if it was assigned a particular semantic class, you can also assign uh, the LiDAR point that same semantic class as well. So we get this kind of uh, painted LiDAR. And then in the final row, it's using that uh, painted LiDAR to predict a bird's eye view top down uh, representation of the local road layout around the eco vehicle and it's predicting the locations of other vehicles and it's also doing a final trajectory plan for the eco vehicle as well as predict predicted trajectories for the other vehicles. Um, and so this is also just kind of showing a, a nice sandy check that in fact these predictions look reasonable on our data which is always good to verify. Okay, so just a, a final few ingredients that we need to, uh, to, to um, get out of the way before we can uh, get to our um, final pipeline is just a, a few extra modifications we need to the uh, more standard approach that I was talking about with the um, images as before. So one of these is that uh, we need to have some additional inputs to the driving algorithm that the humans did not actually get to see. So the humans in the simulator, of course, were not looking at LiDAR, um, and we're also not looking at uh, four different cameras simultaneously. And so we actually use the recorded state from the simulator and render these additional inputs in the format that the driving um, algorithm uh, needs to be able to do inference. And this is kind of a, some, I guess, information asymmetry where the, the driving algorithm is going to have access to more information than the humans had during driving. Um, but it might not be quite as different as it might appear at first because um, unlike the humans, the driving algorithm only gets to see this current snapshot of the inputs when it's making its decision of what to do next. And so with humans, as they're driving through the environment, they're presumably coming up with some mental representation, not just of the current image, but of what they've seen over the past several seconds and using that to make their decision. Um, but the, the uh, driving algorithm is not able to have all of that uh, temporal information. And so maybe some of this additional information that it's getting isn't so different from what might be going on for the humans. Yeah, possibly, it's hard to say for sure. Um, and then another thing that we needed to do was to uh, actually reduce the amount of features that we were getting from this, this deep neural network. So across all of the modules in the uh, learning from all vehicles uh, architecture, there's uh, tens of millions of activations that we can measure for every single input that we get. And uh, this wasn't actually tractable to all store on our lab machine, uh, much less actually do regression on top of it. And so we needed some way to actually uh, get this down to a more manageable scale. Um, the first thing I thought of doing was to just do PCA. So the idea here would be to take um, for example, one of the layers of this um, semantic segmentation network, which has on the order of around 100,000 features, and then extract some uh, principal components uh, from those features across our data set, and then use those as the features to do regression against with the brain. Um, unfortunately, this uh, didn't seem to work that well in practice. We were getting kind of inconsistent results uh, between the different experimental subjects when we did this. And it also, uh, there were, we had to make a lot of decisions that seemed pretty arbitrary in terms of like which parts of the network we were doing PCA on because we actually couldn't um, do every, we couldn't do every possible component um, across all of the features in the network at once because we would completely run out of memory. And so um, this was a, you know, it, it seemed like it, this was a, a part of this um, pipeline that could really use some improvement. And so what we ended up eventually doing instead was uh, this idea called sparse random projections. And the idea here is that if we take our uh, matrix of features from the uh, driving algorithm from the lab network, 
and we actually multiply it by a, a sparse random matrix, so a sparse matrix that's drawn from a certain distribution, um, we can get a, a new matrix with a reduced number of features that actually preserves the um, uh, properties of the original matrix uh, with a certain probability threshold to a certain degree of accuracy, is, is kind of the structure of this. And the reason we can get away with this here is that even though we have a very, very large number of features, um, the number of frames that we have is much smaller by comparison. So like I said, we have on the order of like 100 million features, um, but we only have, because of the limited data that we were able to collect from the humans, um, we only have on the order of a few thousand uh, temporal uh, points or samples of each of these feature vectors. And so the rank of this feature matrix is really limited by the number of uh, samples that we have rather than the number of features. And so by doing this sparse random matrix uh, or sparse random projection transformation of these features, uh, we're able to get a matrix that has you know similar rank to the original one, but is much, much smaller in the uh, feature dimension. Um, another uh, really nice uh, uh, benefit of, of doing this approach is that it's quite fast. Um, you can put this uh, sparse random matrix on your GPU and just do the multiplication on the GPU um, right after the inference of the driving network. And it basically adds very little latency um, to what you already needed to do to, to get the features in the first place. Um, and then one final uh, benefit of this is that unlike with PCA, where we were sort of only taking the highest variance features and throwing the rest out, um, in this case, all of the input features can contribute to this final sort of matrix that's, that's summarizing the um, original feature information. And so we hypothesized that's actually why we were able to get better results using this as opposed to the PCA. And then uh, the um, absolute final ingredient that I, I should quickly mention is that uh, because we have um, the, the driving network is split into these separate modules that are doing uh, slightly different things, um, we're actually going to be fitting a separate model for each of these uh, spaces of features, or feature spaces, um, and we're going to be choosing a, a separate uh, regularization parameter in our linear regression for each of these. So the final form of the regression we have is like a uh, standard, I have a mouse, there we go. Um, we have a, a standard um, linear regression here, and then with a um, ridge regularization, so an L2 regularization parameter over here. Um, but we're just learning a separate uh, regularization hyperparameter for each of these feature spaces. And then we fit them all together. And we're allowing the um, final uh, model to sort of uh, determine which feature space is most helpful for uh, doing predictions for each voxel in the, in the brain data. Um, and that's going to give us a way of sort of measuring uh, which feature space is providing the best fit to each part of the brain. So this is, allow, going to, what, this is what's going to allow us to make this connection between parts of the deep uh, neural network for driving and parts of the brain that have different functions. Okay, so that's uh, finally it for all of the method stuff. Um, any last questions on this before I go into the results? Okay. Uh, can you explain again what is the random stats projection? Yeah, totally. So with the sparse random uh, projection, so we take our original matrix and we're just multiplying it by a, uh, a sparse matrix that is drawn from a distribution over, um, basically it's like a set of matrices where most uh, elements are zeros, uh, sparse, but um, there are uh, certain elements that are going to be like one over a square root of a constant that's chosen based on like the number of features and the number of components. So it's just Johnson and Strauss. Yes, exactly. Uh, so every element is independent. Yes. So it was first. So it's a Gaussian sparse matrix. Uh, so it's actually the, the non-sparse elements are Gaussian. It's, it's not a Gaussian one because the. Um, so I, th I think it's. I've seen it's either you do either Gaussian or you do sparse. I don't think I've seen both. The standard approach is without sparse, yeah, for sure. When yeah. people think about this, yeah. Okay. I, I have a thought. So you, so you preserve. You 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 limit the distortion that. Uh, yeah, so Teacher, even though it's, it's not Gaussian, you can still show that it satisfies the Johnson weighted right. stress. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask so, so is can you go back really quick to the diagram of the system LAV, I guess? So is it processing each frame independently? Yeah. So it really is a sequence of images rather than a video? Should I think of it this way? Yes. 
So it's not like four frames stacked. Because oftentimes you'll do like four frames. It's really just a single frame. So there are four images, but they're from different viewpoints. At the same point yeah, in time. Yeah, but, but it's actually a single instant in time. Are you going to talk about the time issues? Like what is the frequency with which you're recording versus? Sure. Yeah, so the I don't have like a special slide for this. Okay, we can but... do it. Do it. All right. Um, can you say again how you partition the features into these different feature spaces? Yeah, so the this was a little bit of a design choice where I, I was trying to do something that seemed reasonable. And the thing that I landed on was to divide it based on the training objective. So um, like I mentioned, there were like two stages to training. There was like a stage where each of these modules were trained separately. And then there's a stage where they're all trained end to end. And for each um, like intermediate training objective, I called that a, a different module. Um, and so, for example, the semantic segmentation one uh, at the far left here, the, um, this is a separate module because it gets as input these RGB images, and then it has as output the semantic segmentation, and there's a training objective on how good that semantic segmentation is um, that's sort of independent of what that is being used for downstream in the driving model. And this sort of comparison is between, or this partition is for the reduced feature spaces after you apply the sparse transformation, uh, which yes. then has to be same for all these uh, trainings? Uh, Good question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so, so this is actually going to be a separate sparse random projection for each of these modules. Yeah. So the idea is that if we were doing it for um, different modules together, the, um, the final features we'd get would be mixing the features from the different modules. And so we do separate projections for each of them to keep it all separate. Cool, okay. So um, I'm about to show a series of uh, plots of frames that look like this. And so I just wanted to uh, give you an idea quickly of how to interpret these. So the idea is that this is a uh, flattened um, map of the cortex. And the um, anterior, so the, the front of the, the brain is towards the outside, so the far left and right. And the posterior of the brain is going to be in the center. And then the color of each of these, um, I guess here it's, it's actually a pixel because we flattened it, but each of these is corresponding to um, some, roughly to one voxel. And the color is going to be corresponding to the uh, prediction performance on the test data. So how good of a job our model is doing of predicting the activity of that part of the brain. What are the little, sort of little gray regions? Oh yeah, thank you. So, so these are the uh, known functional regions. And so um, when they're doing the, the scanning for the first time with each of these subjects, there's like a standard uh, suite of tasks that you have them do. Like, for example, look at pictures of faces versus pictures of buildings. And you use the patterns of activation with that to um, draw these little regions around uh, different areas that have uh, that are known to be associated with like faces versus other objects, for example. Form. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the one of these ROIs, which is, um, I think, might be... But this is specific to the subject, for the subject. It is specific to the subject, yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's also a good point. So the most of the brains I'm going to be showing are actually averaged across three subjects. Um, and so this is uh, maybe like getting a little bit into art versus science, but our, our neuroscience collaborators have a way of um, deciding what the best fit of these uh, functional regions should be, um, even when they're averaged across subjects. Um, and so these, these ones are actually this averaged version. So I've been there are many parts of the visual cortex that are retinotopically mapped. Are these all retinotopically mapped? Or? So the, the ones that are highlighted here are, I believe, are all retinotopically mapped. The white ones. Yeah. Okay. So uh, first up, we have the uh, semantic segmentation module. Um, so I guess I, I cheated slightly and, and already showed you a preview of what the brain looks like for this. Um, but because this uh, module is processing these um, RGB images that are uh, being shown also to the subject in the driving simulator, um, it's not so surprising that this module is actually doing the best job of predicting the uh, visual cortex activity. So here we have uh, labeled um, V1 through V4. So V1 is the earliest uh, part of the uh, vision, and then V4 is, is getting a little bit more towards higher level vision. And what you can see is that um, the... Uh, um, voxels that we're able to predict well with this part of the model are, are quite well isolated uh, to this part of the brain that we associate with visual activity. 
So this is a, a kind of a nice result that's in line with these previous um, works that have tried to, for example, compare um, ImageNet CNNs with uh, the visual cortex of the brain as well. So they're lit up at the two ends. The regions go between. So is there some understanding of why they're lit up at the ends of V1, V2 rather than across it? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I, I have a good answer. I think uh, one, one thing that is a little bit different about this task um, versus some other studies is that we're not actually able to force them to look at a specific part of the screen. Um, because so typically when you show a subject an image and then try to like make predictions about their, their neural activity, um, you would force them to look at a specific part so that you know uh, which parts of this like retinotopic organization are corresponding to which parts of the image. Um, but what they found was that when they asked the subjects in the driving simulation to do this, uh, they couldn't really drive that well if they had like their eyes fixed a particular part of the screen. And so um, that is one, I guess, like slight complication on interpreting these results is that they're, even though this is like retinotopically organized, we can't guarantee they're looking at a particular part of the screen. Yeah. So I don't want to derail it too much, but yeah. one more question. So this is retinotopically, V1 and V2 are retinotopically mapped. So presumably the fovea is somewhere at a particular position. Is, is the, are we looking at a foveated region? The top and the bottom? I think the phobia should be in the center. I'm not sure. So, so that's where the action should be. When you drive, you have to use your peripheral vision a lot. That's why they test it. Is that a known phenomenon? Yeah, yeah. Like what, when you do the eye test for driving, they test the peripheral vision. That's because they're looking for glaucoma and stuff. No, no, but why does it matter? Because I feel like I look at things when I drive. <laughs> <laughs> what's, you don't close what's, your eyes. What's your pedestrian <laughs> collision rate? Um, I, <laughs> so, so, so the, is there a known mapping within, let's say, V1? That presumably is trickier to map regions in V1 to specific retina regions. I, I That's believe, not, I you have them? Yeah. And, okay, and based on that map, the fob is in the center. Yes. And just to, so should we think, this is fMRI, right? So should we think of this as a proxy for neural activity? There are all kinds of concerns about fMRIs. They, what they really measure is the flow of blood flow to tissue. Yeah, so I, I, uh, our neuroscience collaborators are, are very careful to always say brain activity instead of neural activity because uh, for, for this kind of reason. But, but you think it's a good proxy? Um, I guess, I mean, yeah. You're betting, you're betting. <laughs> I, you would have to ask the, the neuroscientists. Right. But. Okay, so we don't, it's a mystery, I guess. Who knows? Is there also any connection between different parts of the brain, like you label V1, V2, V3, V4 to different parts of the network? Or is there any correlation in the activation that you see? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't see, I think, um, I'll also show the, the different modules, but the for the most part, it was kind of an either or situation where it's like if you could predict the models that were doing a good job of predicting V1, we're also doing a good job of predicting V4, um, and vice versa for the, yeah. So it did seem to be sort of selecting for the visual cortex as a whole. Okay. Um, so the, the next module that I wanted to talk about was this um, bird's eye view perception module. So this one is going from this uh, painted LiDAR input, and it's doing this prediction for the um, top-down view of the uh, local environment around the, uh, the ego vehicle. And so the way this works is that it takes these uh, LiDAR points and it uh, sort of bins them into uh, a top-down um, sort of spatial representation where so each point gets like assigned to each of these bins, and then it's you get a, a feature vector based on how many points are in each bin and what their semantic uh, class is. And so we use the features from uh, that sort of grid representation as well as features from a, a convolutional backbone that is uh, taking that as input and then doing the final prediction of the top-down image as, as the module for this. And so when we look at the uh, brain activity for this, the um, the regions are actually slightly differently <coughs> located in the different subjects. And so for this one, I'm actually showing the brains of the three different subjects separately instead of the average one. 
Um, but the kind of interesting thing here is that we're getting uh, activity in the somatomotor cortex, as well as a little bit in the um, anterior of the IPS. And the IPS in particular is interesting because this is a part of the brain that has been associated, uh, among other things, with coordinate transformations. And so one hypothesis about how humans are thinking about uh, the local scene when they're driving is that they go from this uh, purely egocentric view of what they see in the image in front of them, um, but then are using that to have some sort of internal mental model of, of um, what the scene might look like from a more um, allocentric perspective. And so if humans are in fact doing something like this, then it would, we would expect to see this kind of representation in the IPS. And so it's interesting that there is, in fact, uh, the ability to predict um, some of this IPS activity um, from these kinds of features. But I think also it's, it's interesting that there, we weren't able to predict uh, larger parts of the brain with these features. And so, you know, this is a, it's, it's pretty speculative. And maybe if there were uh, alternative representations of the scene, they might actually be able to um, predict this activity better. And so this is like maybe one direction for future research would be to look at different um, driving models that have different ways of handling this uh, transformation from the egocentric perspective to the more um, allocentric perspective. Um, next up, we have a uh, prediction module. So this is uh, what's going to be computing uh, predicted trajectories for the uh, other agents uh, in the local environment. And the structure for this is that it takes this um, top-down uh, representation of the scene and it uh, crops a little region around the detection of another vehicle. It passes that into a um, ResNet 18 uh, backbone. And then uh, the output of that is fed into a uh, gated recurrence unit network that is going to be um, doing the final predictions for uh, each point in time up to two seconds in the future. And so when we take uh, all of those predictions, what we get is a set of um, possible driving plans um, for that uh, orange agent there. Um, so this was another module where the uh, activations uh, locations uh, were slightly different in the different subjects, and so I'm showing the, the individual subjects again. Um, I'd say the mo main interesting result from, from this module is that it's actually predicting uh, some activity in areas that we associate with a higher level vision, but specifically areas that we associate with um, perceiving other humans. So for example, the um, EBA is associated with uh, being active whenever you're looking at pictures of body parts, for example. And the um, HMT is associated with uh, seeing biological motion. So if you like see someone walking, for example. And uh, this is interesting because we've sort of seen from some other uh, results, uh, other studies that have come out recently, that when you're driving, you're actually representing um, other vehicles on the road as other humans, uh, not just as from sort of a modeling perspective, but actually the parts of the brain that we typically associate with looking at humans are actually being activated by looking at vehicles. And so this is a, so it has some nice alignment with, with those kinds of results. It, it, there's a fair bit of a variability between S2 and S3. So S2 highlights HMT, but not EBA. But then that seems to be the opposite for subject three. Is that, do you have any insight into why that? Me. Yeah, so Tian Zhao has uh, talked about actually treating the HMT and the EBA, at least in the context of driving, as um, almost like a complex that's doing something quite similar. Um, and for, for example, um, one reason you might think of this is that, uh, like when I said biological motion, um, I don't know if you've ever seen like those video clips of when they put like uh, reflective markers on someone while they're walking, and if you just see the reflective markers, you can actually tell immediately that it's Johansson someone walking. I, I, didn't, I don't know if that's what it's called. That's called. Um, but yeah, so, so that kind of uh, activity is something that is both um, activating your like thinking of someone's body, but also <coughs> thinking of it as motion. And both of these things seem to um, be active in kind of uh, similar ways in the context of driving. And so there's kind of like these canonical ways to draw these regions uh, when we're doing these, these fMRI scans. But maybe in the context of driving, it really doesn't make sense to be, to be separating them in quite that way or something like this. Um, and then we have, uh, as well, a planning network. So this is going to be doing something uh, very similar to the prediction network, um, but now it's going to be doing this uh, trajectory plan for the eco vehicle rather than just a prediction for the other vehicles. And the uh, only addition uh, to this part of the, the model is that it, after it does the first uh, gated recurrent unit, 
it does a second one where it takes in a target waypoint to actually uh, refine that plan to be towards whatever the current driving goal is. And so in, for this example, um, the, the uh, target waypoint is going to be to do a right turn. And so the final plan that is output by the second uh, GRU is actually going to be trying to complete a right turn there. So you, you probably said, and I forgot, but the human uh, subjects are given the route, the route to drive or told what to do each intersection, some other form? Yeah, so the, the human drivers are completing actually a, like a memorized navigation task. Um, and so they're actually being told, like, go to this, uh, like, specific location in the environment. So they have they, seen the environment before. Yeah, they've actually memorized it by the time we, we have collected this data. But uh, so the only novel thing that they see potentially is other vehicles, which are somewhat randomized. Yes. But everything else in the rest of the environment is the same. Well, it is, it is like a two kilometer by two kilometer environment, so they probably don't have it memorized on like a very yeah, detailed yeah, okay. level. But, but yeah. they have seen it. Yes. yes. I see. And then they actually control in the simulator yes. the driving. I see. Yeah, so we get these target waypoints by actually looking at what the humans do and then pretending that was, you know, what the intended plan was all along so that the driving network is always getting the same sort of set of directions to like follow what the humans are doing. Have you tried ever to show them the video of driving without having them control it? Uh, not not yet from Rice Getter, yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so the uh, results for the planning model look like this. Um, so this is actually the one that uh, does the best job of, of um, explaining activity across uh, a large parts of the brain. And in particular, it's doing a really good job of predicting activity in the somatomotor cortex, which is the um, M1 and S1, H and F. So F is for foot and H is for hand. Um, these particular uh, parts of the somatomotor cortex are really relevant to this task because they're actually driving with a steering wheel and pedals within the simulator. Um, or within the fMRI machine. And so those are the, the parts of their body that they're actually using to control the, the simulator. Um, we're also able to do uh, fairly good predictions of a large part of the um, IPS, as well as, again, some of these uh, EBA and HMT kind of biological motion areas as well. Um, and I thought, yes? I want to make sure I'm looking at these maps, these heat maps correctly. So these are not the, the brain activity. These are the how accurately your model predicts where. So if no activity was happening, your model predicted no activity, it would be right, right arm. Uh, yes, that's yeah, true. Like so the, before, I think, our discussion about the phobia was a little misguided. It's not that there's no activity in the phobia. It's just we don't predict. Not predict. No, but... Maybe there's a lot of activity. But if, if the interesting it. thing is happening in the fovea, you would hope that you would get some understanding of the. But the stuff. but the computer doesn't have fovea vision. Right, I realize that too. So what you really need to know is you need to track, like you were saying, track where yeah. the guy is, where the person is looking, and use that. Yeah. That, that is an action. Yeah, so we actually do have uh, eye tracking data, and one of the possible directions for future work would be to try and figure out if there's a good way to like, limit what the model can see to what the person is actually looking at at that time, if there's a way to do that without perturbing so things just too took much. took the eye tracking data, data and added it to the predicting. Right? That would give you a map between the image and the... The eye tracking data would allow you to map the image to the retina. That's true, but most of the, the driving network features are not going to be like clean, cleanly assignable to a certain part of the image, right? Because most of it is, is very far downstream of the input image. So maybe, I think that, that might work for like the layer that is like right after the input image, but I think we need to do something a little bit on top of that too. So I'm still a little bit mystified why you can predict the periphery but not predict the podium. Well, so, so one reason might be that the uh, periphery is relatively consistent. So if you're looking at like different, um, different like vehicles it's or different in sense of die position. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Question. So are we seeing training data or like test data here? This is test data. This is the prediction performance on the test data. I have just a, a couple more of these to show. So there's a. Oh, how? Uh, so you're not given the image that having a like a driver view or something, right? How is it possible that the, the activation of the hand and the foot get uh, predicted correctly? Right? You just can't like looking at the the driving thing. How am I know like 
my hand and foot are going to be activated. No, 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 but people are driving. But the, the input is just images. Input to the network. Yeah, just images. Yes. But this is this but is this part is of a network which predicts how to press the pedal and yeah, turn the steering wheel. I mean, the input of this algorithm contains like human training data. Right, basically. Yeah. Human training data. It contains it contains the targets for this prediction are based on people turning the steering wheel and pressing the pedal. Oh, oh, oh I see. So, so I think it's a good question because the it's true that the neural network is actually the final thing it's predicting is the um, trajectory for a few time steps in the future. So it's not actually doing like the exact prediction of the like how you should like turn your hands to, to turn the steering wheel. Um, so the fact that we are able to predict this is, is almost certainly because there's a very high degree of correlation between the like predicted um, trajectory for the vehicle and how you're going to move your hands to, to be able to do that. Um, but I, I do think that's like a good, I guess, like a cautionary point about uh, interpreting these results is that um, all we're able to really say here is that we're able to, to do a good prediction um, based on this set of features. But it does that doesn't necessarily mean that the... Um, the activity in the brain is like exactly the same as the, the set of features that we extract from the, the neural network. It just means they're highly correlated. So and this is like 9% R squared is like the brightest, right? Yep. So like how good is that? Like and is it like I mean nine percent sounds low to me. Is there yes, just it like is, a lot of low. noise or like is the fit good but there's a lot of noise or <laughs> so this is this is pretty normal amounts of uh, prediction power for fMRI data. So fMRI is very noisy. Um, and also there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going on in the brain that is not going to be fully determined by what you're looking at when you're doing this task. You know, you could also be um, thinking about uh, how you're going to structure your slides for your upcoming talk or, you know, all sorts of other things. And so um, there's, there's pretty severe limits on what we can expect to be able to predict, both because of how we're measuring it and because there's a lot of other stuff going on in the brain. But yeah, this is comparable. Okay. Um, so there's also a hazard detection module, which is, this is like, I think, maybe a kind of strange uh, artifact of like this very specific architecture. Um, but it separately, uh, in addition to the predicted trajectory, which in theory should include the ability to stop if there's an obstacle, it does a separate um, network on the RGB images and just outputs a binary decision of whether you need to break or not. And if this module says to break, it actually overrides the predicted trajectory. So it's it's sort of a kind of a almost a hack to... Um, decrease the amount of times that the model ends up violating some traffic rule or doing something uh, incorrect. And what we see with this is that the uh, predictions are fairly similar to the semantic segmentation module, um, maybe a little bit more concentrated to the, the bottom part, which is corresponding to the upper visual field, uh, which we unfortunately don't have like a super clear uh, explanation for this. We have some hypotheses, but none of them are that great yet. Um, but it's, it's also doing uh, mostly predictions of the uh, visual cortex, which again is not surprising because it's doing some uh, operations on these RGB images. And then finally, we also separated out the final plan tra trajectory and break decision into a separate module because we observed that this improved overall uh, prediction performance. And uh, when we ran this one, we found that it was doing uh, similar um, predictions to, or similar, um, the areas that we saw uh, good predictive performance were pretty similar to the planning module, um, but not quite as good as the, the planning module. And then finally, when we uh, put all of these together, we can, for each voxel in the brain, we can say um, which module did the best job of performing that voxel. And we get a map that looks like this, where um, Similar to what we saw with the individual modules, uh, the semantic segmentation and the hazard detection are pretty localized to the um, visual cortex, whereas the uh, planning and control modules are explaining a lot more of the somatomotor cortex, as well as um, some higher level vision areas that we're associating with perceiving other agents and reasoning about other agents. Now, the in V1, just look at V1, the most thing that's most relevant to the fovea is planning. That actually kind of makes sense. Hazards are coming from the sides. Um, and then uh, quickly, just wanted to mention a couple of potential directions for future work. So one thing that I think would be interesting to do is try to do a little bit more analysis on the pipeline that we use to get these uh, results. 
um, and try to understand how the noise that's present in our measurements, as well as the number of features we're using for the regression, and how correlated those features are, um, correspond to like the final accuracy of our results to kind of, so for example, if we say that a particular voxel is predicted, you know, 80% by the semantic segmentation and 20% by the hazard detection, uh, how confident should we feel about those two numbers and, and about the other modules getting like 0%. So I think it would be really interesting to run some uh, simulations with, with purely simulated data to try and really understand what these results are telling us in a little bit more detail. Um, I think also if we used additional driving models, that would also be really helpful for understanding what's going on here, how much is unique to this specific architecture versus um, how much is, is more general to the different kinds of architectures that are currently being used. 